All right, here we are. Heather right. Tim. Welcome Brady. to welcome to Maker's Place. <laughs> Thank you. Um maybe I guess just to start, maybe you can introduce yourself to to our readers, our listeners. Sure. Um, my name is Heather Tim, and I'm an interdisciplinary artist um, in Seattle. Um, I uh, am somebody who's always been an artist, but I took two decades focusing my career in the technology industry because I'm based in Seattle and I needed to make ends meet. And a couple years ago, um, my worlds collided. My art and my technology backgrounds never sort of intersected. And a few years ago, that all changed. Um, and it's sort of changed the trajectory of my life. Um, I have left my career and have been focused the last couple of years on dedicating myself to my art practice. It's very cool. That's kind of, I also, um, not that anybody asked, uh, but my, my, that's how I ended up at Maker's Place is I saw NFTs open up a place where I could use my my um, tech background as a content manager for tech companies, tech startups, uh, and the previous life uh, of, of art world and film world stuff and kind of combine them. So that's really cool to hear. What was it in 2020 that, that um, sparked this return to art? Were you, I actually, I guess for, for those 20 years, yeah. Were you doing art on the side or was yeah, yeah, I was I was doing some art, but I'm also a parent, so I had two kids and um so a lot of things got shelved. I couldn't balance everything. I made some art, not a lot. Um but I had picked up I had recently picked up painting again, um primarily working in acrylics and I had been doing that and then uh, a series of of unfortunate events unfolded um, that ended up being sort of that blessing in disguise. Um, I, we lost the base one level of our house to a horrible flood. Um, so my kids were, bedrooms were there. They had to move into what was my art studio. Um, and then we were in a horrible car accident, high speed accident on I-5. Um, and it screwed up my right shoulder and I literally couldn't lift it to paint on a canvas. And I was really finding my art a very cathartic and sort of healing thing for me right then. And I really needed an outlet. My son was in an animation class and introduced me to Procreate. And digital painting sort of blew my mind. I really, even though I had been in tech, I wasn't in the design or art end of tech. Right? I was largely in the product end of tech and leadership. Um, and so this had just, those two things just never intersected before. And, and then the rest is sort of history, right? Uh, then it was down the rabbit hole and into AI and everything else and, you know, multimedia. And uh, yeah, changed the course of my life. That's super fascinating. I, you know, I just talked to Danya Darkstone yesterday. She has a very similar story about her move into glitch art um, as being kind of partly motivated by car accidents. And, and also um, I interviewed Chaz Gold, also mm -hmm. a local Portlander uh, not that long ago. And he too, his, his uh, choice of medium was really influenced by by um, a, a home invasion that left him kind huh. of partially uh, paralyzed. Yeah. So it's it's interesting how those things happen and how the technology really opens up. Like accessibility really is like, I mean, for, for Chaz, for instance, AI literally is an accessibility tool the same way like a wheelchair ramp might be. So it's, it's, right. um, it's just interesting. Why um why did you quit art in the first place? Or um, like I said, why was it sidelined? I mean, I know there's kids sure, is a big thing. Sure, I have sure, two sure. Kids, so <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a thing. I, you know, here's the truth: is so I was always creative and always artistic. I never really imagined it as a viable career. 
is the truth, right? So it was more an outlet for my own expression. Um, and I never really, and part of that was just sort of a mindset of like mixing money with something that was so deeply personal for me was a level of vulnerability. I wasn't really able to manage, I think is the truth. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I think that was a lot of it. I would make for myself and my friends, you know, I would get, I'd do my work and I would make it for me or I would make it for other people and I would just, you know, I would gift it to them. Um, so, yeah, and then I, I guess the, the intersection and what made me think about trying to pursue it um as a career was really largely influenced by the people that I met on the interwebs, you know, and connecting with the crypto art community and particularly very influential to me was the trash art community. I mean, I really felt like that, uh, gears just clicked. Like I really, really, the, uh, there's so much nonsense in the art world, um, and gatekeeping, um, and just sort of legacies of the corporatocracy or this elitism when I really, you know, everybody is creative inherently in their bones. They all have different mediums in which they express that creativity, right? Um, just some things aren't identified as high art, <laughs> right? And so um, when I found the trash art community, I really like my heart sang in a way that it hadn't in a long time um, because they, people were just really honest and a lot of it was performance art against the very, you know, um, culture that they were finding themselves in. Was it that group that kind of let allowed you to kind of fuse vulnerability and commerce? Um, yeah, I think a bit, I think it was really the trash and glitch art community and the people who intersect with that, that really just sort of, um, opened up my mind and maybe inspired me to pursue that and just let go of all of the, you know, all the other shenanigans, um, and just really explore myself creatively, um, and, and let everything else go. What was it about trash art? I mean, I think... I mean, I can probably infer a bit about why trash art is such the perfect genre to enter into um, as, a, as a new artist, but maybe you can fill in those blanks. Yeah, I think here for me, I mean, I have always had this pretty deep and abiding sense that... Um, you know, just like we're, we're all inherently creative. I also think unless you were spitting pigment over your hand in a cave, everything is kind of derivative. And what we're all doing is just trying to remix and express a cocktail of different pieces and parts of our experience into something that is expressing itself through us, right? And so like remixing and just going headlong into these ideas of just like uh, taking things and, and using them for multi-purposes, remixing each other's art, being really uh, open and honest about that was like just refreshing to me. Um, because again, I think there can be a lot of gatekeeping um, within communities, whatever they are. And I don't think this is like, uh, specific to art. I think this can be a lot of humans will guard and protect and defend rather than open up, invite and include. Um, and so I just wanted to be on the part that was wildly open, like just unabashedly open and welcoming and a big boat to invite everybody in. Right. Like that feels right to me. Totally. Yeah. I love the whole trash art crew, um, talking, communicating with them. Um, it's just, they're always, yeah, all of them are always great. A absolutely. Um, 
There, there. Actually, there's one person who's a little thorny, but uh, we'll leave that one out. You, you know, you always have to. You have to have that too, right? That's just that's. <laughs> yeah. We're all trash. <laughs> so my next question is a little long. I'm going to have to read it because it's pulling from your bio. Okay. Um, so the bio on your site contains a little nugget that I'd like to drill down into. Mm -hmm. So it reads, my interdisciplinary work is characterized by a rejection of preconceived notions about what art is or should be. I do not limit myself to any single medium, style, or technique. My approach is to allow my art to behave as all matter within a system does. It transforms as it interacts with other matter and its environment. So now that you've mm -hmm. rededicated yourself to visual art um, for a while, I guess it's now going on three years, um, have you discovered any unconscious preconceived notions you hold and, and that come up in your art? And, and if so, how do you, do you consciously try to overcome them yeah. or do you embrace them as a part of you? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the answer is yes to all of those things, right? So I think that's one of the things is just holding, being able to hold the complexity of who I am and um, know that sometimes that is at, like I am at odds with myself in, in the process sometimes um, where I am, I do have those, right? Like I, I have not yet figured out how to consistently detach from my experience as a member of our society or all of the messages that I have received, right? So those things can influence me. Those things can make me self-critical. Those things can, you know, like I, I have bajillions of works that nobody has ever seen but me, right? And so part of that, like even just exploring that of what, why, why am I like holding uh, these things? Um, and, and I had a somewhat interesting experience where my, my grandmother recently passed and she was an artist. She was a landscape artist. And um, we were going through her things and I found these amazing Cubist paintings. I never knew she had done anything like that, right? All of her stuff was very realist. And I found out these experimental things and they were like the, my favorite things I had ever seen of hers. And it was kind of one of those like big hammers over the head of like, you cannot, you, you have to get over yourself and, and get that stuff out there because you just don't know who's gonna connect with that. They're like, there's a wrench for every nut out there. Put your stuff out there. There's lots of nuts out there. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of nuts out there. And there's a lot of nuts who need to know they're not alone in that, right? In whatever speaks to them. And so I think um, that was a really interesting lesson for me related to that. How do you think then about kind of artistic consistency where... <laughs> there's a bit of a, a, a brand or an identity where people are like, I go to look at Heather's art to feel this way mm -hmm. versus total eclecticism. Yeah. I'm exploring mediums and doing what I want. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm using source material from, from different places. Like they're just not worrying about it. How do you think yeah. about a balance between those things, especially as somebody who is making a full-time career out of it? versus somebody who just wants to do nights and weekends. Yeah. Yeah, look, I I think here for me, I think there's room for all of that. I think it really depends on what you're what you feel you're called to do and what's authentic to you. For me, um I get the whole notion of the of a of a brand. Um and that that might sell and I may very well be making it harder for myself to make a career being honest about my desires and about my expression. That's a risk I'm willing to take, right? Because I think otherwise it's not real creative freedom for me. I'm not really expressing whatever's happening and collapsing in that moment for me, if I'm like second guessing and trying to build a, a perception 
and buffalo anybody into paying for something that is just, you know, whatever. I mean, and that's fine if other people, there are other people who, you know, have a, a real style and it is their thing and it makes their heart sing and it is their, their identity and it is a part of them and it's very authentic. That is just not me and it's never been me, you know? Um, so I try to, I try to stick with things to explore them in a series. But often, uh, you know, it's almost like how I read books. I start a book, there's some citation about something else in the book, and I'm like, a squirrel, what? That's even more interesting than this book. So I have to learn more about that to really understand the whole system and connection. And so I feel like a lot of my art practice is that, is like, honoring the parts that make the whole and that together it is a bit of a gestalt it you know it, it is greater than any one of the parts just doing that and being that mm -hmm. your piece uh grandmother earth has mm. an alternate title unsimaka mm -hmm. which is lakota native american word for grandmother earth Mm -hmm. which I learned in my research is a sacred mm -hmm. entity that must be cared for by everyone. And um, so there's that. You also give a land recognition on mm -hmm. your website um, yeah. to the native tribe that, that uh, originally populated or still does to some extent Seattle. Yep. Um, do you have any special relationship or, or special interest uh, relationship to or interest in uh, native cultures. Yeah, I mean, look, I just think it's it's the it's the truth of our history. They are the stewards of our land. They were here before us. Um, so I do like I feel a a a, a kinship. I I do not have any uh, Native American heritage. I have friends who are Native and Indigenous people. Um, I have deep respect for that culture. I've studied uh, comparative religions. And so I, I, you know, that was my first sort of introduction into um, understanding different indigenous cultures. Um, and yeah, I think that stewardship of the earth and as our, as our mother and the, you know, bringer of life to us all is something that really resonates with me personally. Um, I guess there's also the You Can't Erase Us series, mm -hmm. uh, which also has a figure of uh, a Native American woman, as well as a young Muslim girl reading a book and, um, and a trans uh, woman. Can you tell me about, and this is an ongoing series. Those are the pieces yeah. that I've seen. I know that you have more in the works or maybe even done. Can you tell me a little bit about this? Um, we're going to be sure. featuring it on, on Maker's Place soon, so I'd love to learn more about that. Sure. Yeah, this has been really deeply personal for me, um, series, maybe the most personal work. Um, I was really inspired by um, a lot of the um, anti-trans legislation that's happening um, in the United States. Um, also, the overturning of Roe v. Wade um, and just the sense of body autonomy, of, of human beings have a, having autonomy over their own selves. Um, and, um, and through that, I just, you know, it, it's impossible to know history and not be able to find the linkages back to all of the former... Um, attempted erasures of people throughout history, throughout time. Again, it's not, it, it's not um, specific to the United States, although that's where I am. So a lot of my work speaks to that, but I'm using it as an opportunity to explore erasure and also to sort of use the art as a call to action to allies and marginalized communities to stand up for one another because by and large uh, there's so many most of us have been a part of some community 
that has been attempted to be erased. And that together, right, we hold the future. We are the future. Um, and so it was also this sort of call to give energy. So the work, although it's about a very deep and, and, and really honestly scary set of circumstances that have happened over history and are happening right now, it is infused with color and light and the energy that people need to come together to just create the future that we know is unfolding in front of us, right? I feel like a lot of what is happening is this sort of last gasp of a dying person, like the last gasp of dying old ways and paradigms of being and norms, right? To really come into this future where we celebrate diversity, right? We celebrate variety as the spice of life and what makes us amazing as people. Um, and so that's kind of a little bit about that, that series. Yeah. It feels like a very prolonged last gasp. <laughs> it, <laughs> like it, could, it is. Could right? be a little shorter. It could stand for, yeah. for people to get over things a little quicker, but, um, are what, besides the three that I mentioned, can you describe sure. any of the other pieces in the series? Sure. I mean, I think this, the pieces that you saw were probably early um, pieces in there. Some of them have evolved. They, the, the, I have um, a, a trans woman outside uh, a, a restroom, right? <laughs> uh, that's a real thing. Um, I have uh, also a, a, a Jewish father um, with his daughter sitting in his lap in a subway station, um, hearkening back to the Holocaust, to anti-Semitism, um, and, uh, the other one, I'm trying to remember, there, there's so many of them, because part of this series too, Brady, that I'll mention is part of what I'm doing is I'm using synthography, right? So artificial photography, using artificial intelligence. And what I'm doing is uncovering a lot of bias through this series as well. And so I'm, I'm uncovering bias and I'm documenting the bias and then I'll, I'm reporting the bias to try to like <laughs> make sure all these, these machines that are really driving us into a technological future, we have an opportunity. AI is really an opportunity for a cultural self-reflection of our existing power structures and biases and how we might infuse them with things that are more grounded in the reality, true reality of the world and our interconnectedness. Like I really think we could do something there. And I want this to be sort of some of the underpinnings of, of those pieces. Um, and one of the things that I'll, you know, just basic stuff. The majority of people in the world are Asian, okay? <laughs> the largest population in the world. When you are doing a generic prompt about people or about couples or about in a warm embrace, there are certain things you're just not going to see, which is representation of the actual world and its makeup, mm -hmm. right? You don't see those things in the systems, right? So you start by doing these things. Sometimes I move from very specific calls to get the art piece to very generic pieces to see what it gives me without giving the specificity and the direction that's required to pull truth out of the machine because truth won't come in a generality. Mm -hmm. What are the kinds of biases that you see, like say you're prompting you know, I can imagine, like, you write Jewish dad, and oh, there would yeah. be versions that are just sure, of like nineteen fifties, like cartoons of right. Jewish people, or, yeah. or Native American seems like also pretty dicey, considering, right. considering you know, yeah, how long it's taken for for the the society at large to even kind of respect Native Americans. Right. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, all of that stuff holds true, right? You get things that are, that are, um, 
stereotypical and sometimes it, I mean the more uh, even maybe more upsetting than that is just the complete lack of a return unless you are specific about what you're asking for right like <laughs> uh, you know if, if you don't say a diverse group of people you you often get a lot of white people <laughs> yeah right on a sidewalk, right? A crowded, busy group of people on their way to work. Well, what do those people look like? I assure you they are not what it looks like when you walk out on your street <laughs> in your downtown, right? So it's just, and, and part of that is just where we're gathering the information, the internet, what a lot of media companies will focus on, right? And um, so I think there's just a real opportunity to, to, to come correct and be more representative in that. Yeah, that's interesting. I come from a background in screenwriting, and there is definitely a move, especially in the last, say, five to seven years. You know, if you read a screenplay, the, the default, um, you know, you say like, John, a man in his 50s, whatever, the default is just like, you're going to cast that as a white man. Even yeah. if, like, you literally have to say in a screenplay these days for people to get the point, like, this could be any... Right. Ra there's, like, yeah. no racial boundaries on this right. character. Like, just right. go go right. hog wild. Whoever yeah. you want. Um, yeah. But otherwise, they're just, get, like, the default is you will picture or, or cast just a white person. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's fascinating. And so now, yeah, AI, you have to do that. But then also, you have to make sure that it's not some wildly offensive uh residue of our right. of our past that's right that's <laughs> right right you know yeah i mean there's a lot of cleanup in aisle three to be done brady yeah <laughs> you know? I, I would love to see i bet it would be an amazing piece of content if you were to do something like a video around like these are the the representations of uh, the standard representation of Jews that you get from Mid Journey, or uh, I would love to see that. Like, yeah. and how do you get around it? And, and like, and that would probably be very informative for the people who are actually designing these and, yeah. and training them. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing I want when I have time is also taking those sort of things and then using something like Clip Interrogator to try to understand where that came from. Oh, what's Clip Interrogator? Right. So, I it's it is um, a tool that was made um, to try to get a prompt, like reverse engineer. You upload an image, and it'll give you a prompt that, optimized for stable diffusion, would return something similar. So often, it sort of reveals the influences behind oh, okay. the image right and so it, it's a really interesting tool that way um i've used it actually on some of my physical paintings as well um just to see what what it says about my influences and how correct it is what have you found yeah. um it was pretty accurate it was pretty accurate i did it on um I, here i'll show you the piece that i i recently did it on and it was um uh, uh painting i don't know if the light is not great in here but it's just you know a colorful painting of a fiddlehead fern unfolding right very much inspired by georgia o'keefe's style <laughs> and clip interrogator pretty much you know told me that so. georgia o'keefe of the pacific northwest <laughs> with those fiddlehead ferns <laughs> love it so I'm fascinated by your piece, Echoes from the Merge. Can you tell me about mm. this piece and the significance? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, so that, that sort of piece was, um, I mean, it's a little bit Black Mirror, maybe. <laughs> um, <sighs> that piece was really just sort of exploring the... Um, intersection of, um, you know, humans merging with machines and sort of what we're seeing and what we have seen. I mean, this has been a long time sort of coming, but really even our, 
our brains, how we process information has radically changed because of the technology in our lives. Um, and we've been merging with machines for a long time in that way. Um, people, um, you know, I, I think I was I was looking at sort of the transhuman community and some of the things that are happening. Um, you know, on the dark web, you can buy biohacking kits. You can chip yourself today. There are people who are doing this who are already, you know, experimenting and exploring um, being augmented humans. You know, that's already happening. That's not a future thing. It's like now. Um, and so part of it was really just sort of exploring, you know, exploring that space, um, both the hopeful end of that and the sort of somewhat terrifying end of that and holding both of those at the same time. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. I think yeah. about that kind of stuff a lot and, and almost more and more kind of with every passing week, you know, you see Apple Vision Pro one week and you're like, okay, well, that's that's coming. That's going to change life as we know it in these particular ways. And then something else comes down the line. You're like, all right, well, that you can cast your net like uh, 10 years in the future and think, wow, it's going to that's going to be weird. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, there will be genetically modified and and organic humans. I mean, that is, you know, that that will be the case, right? Right. Yeah. And the I mean, you know, one thing that I've been noticing and piecing together in my head is when are we going to start like literally and this is going to sound sci-fi. Um because it all sounds sci-fi, but there, I, I fully believe that one day we'll be able to grow a human that is a computer, um, which is like they're they're like I've seen researchers are trying to use artificially grown brain matter as a piece of hardware because sure. it's more efficient than silicon. Well, yeah, DNA holds way more, right? I mean, our our DNA is our code. We're already right. executing it. So at what point? <laughs> right. And this morning I look in the news and, and, and there's something about scientists able to grow an embryo without male or female input, like just from scratch. Um, so, you know, it's all very crazy. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm curious while we're on, I mean, we're on this topic of, of science and and also art. Echoes from the Merge has an interesting little, not mechanic, I, don't, I guess there's a, the interesting element of it is, one of them is that it is 47 seconds long for a very particular reason. And then in the, from the same series, For the Love of Machines last 37 seconds, also for a very particular reason. I don't remember off the top of my head what those reasons are. Um, can you elucidate your your thinking um yeah you do elucidate elucidate your thinking on your site but i'm curious um is this some is are these the kinds of things that you think about with every piece and and also maybe because i didn't write it down why the 47 seconds and why the 37 seconds oh yeah, yeah, yeah. um so often i use um when when i'm making something i try to draw connections to different things right so i think to me um involving like intentionally involving math in how long something runs is interesting to me because i think math is just math philosophically is interesting to me um i think it's um the language of patterns and connections that we use as people and so i often use it as an opportunity to explore math theory so i'll go down a rabbit hole when i am creating something to try to discover something that i might not know about math and in this case the 47 seconds is about a, a, a super prime 
Uh, this was an area of math I'm really uh, was not aware of. It's related to um, some quantum math theory and is just inherently something that it, it somewhat boggles the mind and gives me this warm comfort that there is some it, math as a fabric of an underpinning of things um i think is also this area that gives me both deep comfort and i find somewhat existentially upsetting <laughs> at the same time right um so i mean that that's some of the reason behind the 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 seconds of of runtime there um, why why the existential upset Sure. I, I mean, I don't know. I guess maybe it's it's some letting go of a human ego um, in that process that creates this sort of discomfort. But like, I think AI art brings us up for a lot of artists, right, who use it or don't use it is like, wow, a lot of things can really be reduced to an algorithm, right? To like, there is this thing behind it and it's like oh and i'm just really just executing my code i'm just executing my dna and how are we how is it different what is the creative process right so it gets into that sort of level of things of what does it mean to create right mm -hmm. um so yeah i think that that's where i can really get into a bit of a of a whole, but but I think more than anything, I, I feel somewhat hopeful um, about it because I think there's something, there's an interesting connection there. Um, and I think we're just creating things that are a replication of what what we are. You know what I mean? Like we're just, everything is trying to propagate itself mm -hmm. in this way. Um, and I think it's just an unfolding, not unlike the fiddlehead fern. There's just this un, this fractal unfurling of things over time. I'm amazed at the breadth of your work, especially considering that you have only really been avidly at it for three or four years. Um, at this point, uh, you know, there was many years of, of casual work, but it's really the last three or four years that you have dedicated yourself to this. It's also the last three or four years that you even discovered digital art. Mm -hmm. Um, you have examples of, I, I never, I just say, I, when I'm, I, and I actually don't know how people say this out loud because i've never said it out loud a a s c i i i don't know if people say like assy ass guy <laughs> um glitch art trash yeah. art generative art ai art the two are not the same there um digital painting animation illustration photography you've even done an augmented reality experiment mm -hmm. within these mediums you explore different genres um so the question there is really what's your balance between creating and learning and um, and how do you know when to push yourself to go wider versus pushing yourself to go deeper mm, mm -hmm. yeah i think that's a really great question i think um part of having a lot of work and being so prolific is the fact that I, I did spend, you know, almost two decades not doing much. And so I think I had a lot pent up just waiting to come out. And so I think, um, I think that's kind of where I'm at in that sort of unfolding of myself is I'm like exploring all the nooks and crannies that I haven't. Um, will i arrive somewhere <laughs> i don't know i hope not kind of i think the journey itself is what's most interesting right it's the thing that holds nostalgia for us are the moments along the road not the actual getting there um so uh i think <sighs> yeah this deeper thing is 
I, I think part of going really wide has been because I can tend to go really deep sometimes. Um, but so deep that it gets into a non-productive place for me. And so it's a little bit pushing myself to go out before I collapse it back in. I mean, I think it's all a, a process of expansion and contraction over and over again. And I feel like... Um, I am in a point and have been for the last maybe couple of months where I'm starting, I feel like a contraction coming in where I, I feel this a little more uh, deep and introspective, a little more, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not out and involved in as much as I have been partially because I'm trying to process and go a little bit deeper with with some of my work and also with myself to just make sure that by going wide, I'm not staying at the surface or trying to maintain a level of comfort. Again, that wouldn't be productive, right? Right. I'm curious when you're going too deep and you find yourself like, or I'm now experiencing an unproductive level of depth. Is that kind of you're over planning? You're doing too much research? How do you how do you feel? Like what are the signals yeah. that you pick up on? I, I think it's an analysis paralysis. You know what I mean? Where where I I think as soon as I get into like too much existential dread about things, where I'm like spinning, I'm like the cat chasing its tail till it's dead. <laughs> little bit is kind of a, a visual I try to pull myself out with humor or imagining like ridiculous things like what I'm doing in my between my left ear and my right ear um, I think those are the times right like just if I'm being critical of one's work is absolutely necessary being over critical of one's work is just complete nonsense you know what I mean like uh, we should want to elevate, we should want to improve, we should, you know, we should check ourselves, not everything we release is great, you know. Um, but we can also, as artists, most artists that I know, regardless of what your medium is, even if you're doing your, your code, your, right, you're a painter, you're a sculptor, tend to be very sensitive. A lot of what people are doing are putting really deep parts of themselves into their work, even if it's only an idea or a concept, that connection is real. So <clears throat> I think artists can tend to be overly self-critical and can err on um, over editing themselves, right? And I think that that's, uh, that's risky because you never know what's gonna land and you start having, as soon as you start having feelings for other people about what they're gonna think for your art, you've kind of jumped the shark. You know what I mean? You're now feeling for other people. You've just totally moved beyond your locus of control, right? You shouldn't do that. You should put stuff out and just see what really comes back. Just like you would, like I take that from my product. I, sometimes I do have to take that, that, that uh, business stuff that I did learn in business that can help me in my art, which is, you know, in product, you're just releasing these little increments all the time to get feedback to see what's most useful. Artists, same thing. You should release a lot of your work. See what people connect with, right? Like you connect with all of it, obviously, or you wouldn't be making it. But there are certain things that are going to, to really connect with people. And you'll never know if they sit in your file folder or on your wall. Is there anything else from your business background that, that you've noticed as, as providing helpful tools or mental models? Um, I don't know if this came from business, but I think it might have come from even before then, but I applied it in business and it, it just, it, it stands, you know, and that is that act as if, and you will become, you know, I, I think show up like you belong there and you belong there um 
you know, I found myself working in technology. I was often the only woman in the room. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, it can and, and there can be big personalities. And I worked in some, you know, with with I've worked with some very, very big personalities. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I think that's that's just really important to just hold the truth of who you are. We all belong. If you're drawing breath, you matter. You belong wherever you find yourself. Yeah, I think that's going to be the the headline for this um, this interview is "Act as if and you will be." I love that. What's your creative process for career building? Mm. I don't think it's framed often enough as a creative process, and you know. Have, we're both coming from from tech backgrounds. I come from a marketing background, so I, I definitely see the potential there to create to treat it like a creative process and to have fun with it. There's also the potential to just slog away and and adhere to a checklist. Yeah, you know, I feel like honestly, Brittany, this is something that I'm trying to figure out for myself. You know. Um, I feel like I was really successful in business and I've been really successful in life. Um, you know, I was a, I was a runaway teenage drug addict and, uh, I, I've lived a great life. I'm in, you know, I have a wonderful family. I have, you know, stable housing. Uh, I have just a ton of, of amazing things and I've, I've had, um, an amazing life. I've had an amazing career in technology. Uh, and I never business. I was very successful at, I really don't feel I've cracked the nut of what, what it means to be a career artist. Um, and it's, um, yeah, it, it feels like it's something I'm trying to figure out. I I like your notion that it can be a creative thing, right? Because there's a part of me that feels like Ugh, it's this other thing. And, uh, and that might just that mindset may be keeping me from really experiencing something different, right? Or imagining something different um, and what it could be. Yeah, I mean, perhaps it's one of my one of my the drum that I like to beat as running content at Maker's Place is trying to write pieces that that encourage artists to think about their careers as a art, artistic project. Um, how did you? So you were a teenage drug addicted runaway. Mm -hmm. What what drug were you addicted to, or drugs? <sighs> If you don't mind me asking. I, well, I mean, this might be my collection uh, or my attraction to trash art. I mean, I was a bit of a trash drug addict. Whatever I could get my hands on, Brady. So um, I wasn't too picky. Um, but I I think the thing that really took me down pretty hard was, um, was crystal meth. Um, but I did a ton of, you know, I, LSD, mescaline. I did a ton of hallucinogenics. I was constantly, you know, smoking pot, um, crystal meth, MDA, ecstasy, you know, whatever, whatever I could do, um, whatever I could get my hands on. And how did you, where did you go from, from there? What, I mean, then you went on to have a successful business in technology or a successful <laughs> career in technology. I imagine that it wasn't one, yeah. one to the other. No, it wasn't one to the other. Um, but I, you know, I basically, you know, I had gotten, I got quite ill, um, and had gone, went back home after getting physically quite sick. Um, I hadn't sobered up then completely, but I had, um, you know, I was just at a point where I didn't really understand what I was doing to myself and why I was harming myself. I wanted to stop and I couldn't. And, um, 
I had what I can really only explain as a spiritual experience. It was just like an overwhelming moment I had as sitting by the side of a river uh, watching something float down it and something just hit me and a voice inside was really like you know it, I knew that was the moment it was a split and I was going to make a decision to either change the course of my life or I it was I was done and um yeah, and, and that sort of set a series of, of things I, I tried to, it was the last time I, I ever used a substance. Um, I had tried to quit many times before that. Um, and, you know, I just trudged along. I, I worked many different jobs to get where I got, uh, uh, right around the dot-com bubble. Um, I decided um, this has also been sort of a pattern in my life. Whenever things are at their lowest, that's when my come up happens. Okay. And that's just been a pattern and I can see it clear as day, clear as day. It happens over and over again in my life. Uh, 13 is my lucky number. You know, all these things, whatever that is, you don't want the black cat. I'll have the black cat because that's my, you know, that's my lucky charm. Um, and uh, I, I got into tech during the during the bubble. Everybody got laid off, you know, and it was things were rough. And I had left a job in sales. You know, I at that point had worked myself into a, a job in sales. I didn't have any tech background, um, and I got a part time job uh, filing papers at a tech company. <laughs> filing paperwork at a tech company for two weeks and I sold myself into a job and told them that I would save a customer if they would, you know, they would give me a job. They had, um, they were like, oh, you're in sales. You, you should talk to these people. We've got this customer who's, you know, re they really need help. And so I just sort of made a deal and I said, okay, if I can save this customer for you, you give me a job. And, and I did. And then the rest was history. I went on to work with Microsoft and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I had my own consulting firm. Um, you know, and I did it thanks to the Seattle Public Library and the Internet. Uh, I taught myself everything I knew, and I learned a lot from the people around me. Um, I think that's the other lesson that I really learned is people are really generous. And if you ask them, they'll tell you. So don't be afraid to ask them. What is your what is your view on spirituality or your approach to spirituality? You mentioned spiritual experience and mm -hmm. in, in getting clean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have lots of feelings about it. Um, really not a proponent of organized religion, though have many friends who are, you know, partake, um, as many friends as are atheist humanists. Um, and I probably fall somewhere between there, I think. Um, I just really appreciate, I think, I just really appreciate seeing connection and pattern. And to me, that connection is the thing that's bigger than me, that threads us all, you know, that sort of, um, I am a drop of water and the ocean. We all are. Um, I think for me, that's, that hits. It's beautiful. Um, we're running a, a little long and, uh, I, but I still have a few questions. This has been really great conversation um how does how does frustration generally manifest in your creative practice and mm -hmm. and in those moments how do you how do you overcome it do you have a direct route an indirect route combination of both um yeah i mean i do think it is a it might be a little cliche but i think it's just when you hit that point it's time to go touch grass <laughs> You know, like just I, if I'm at that point, then I need to 
part of me, there's part of me that needs to inspect why, like, where is it coming from? What is the frustration, the, the drive to control something that might be manifesting in a different way? And like, when is it time to just lean into the way that it's going? Um, and lean into the chaos? You know, rather than than the tension that mounts a frustration. But if I really am sort of stuck, then it's just time to walk outside and look at the trees. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's just time to take a walk in the woods and like get grounded back into that for me. Totally. Very Pacific Northwest answer. I approve. <laughs> we can take a walk in the woods sometime Brady. absolutely i would love that <laughs> so my last question which is always almost always my last question for these interviews is what advice would you give your 20 year old self about art creativity creative life um anything you wish you'd known any mindset you wish you'd had mm -hmm. wow yeah, I mean, I would just say, hey, girl, um, go find the glitch and trash artists, because as, as soon as you do that, like you're going to find you're going to find your people. Right. And it's going to inspire you um, to explore things that you might have otherwise put on the shelf. Um, and, uh, you know, just just keep showing up for yourself and others. And uh, really appreciate and celebrate those people who are a part of the solution, right? Like that's the energy in, in the tank that you need uh, to do what you need to do. Totally. Love that. Well, Heather Tim, this has been an amazing interview. I loved every second of getting a chance to talk with you and I still have a bunch of questions here on my my list so maybe we'll do a part two down the road oh thank you so much Brady it's been a pleasure well have a great day thank you, you too.